Okay. So, hi everybody. This is uh, I'm Esther Armour, and I'm the creator of Emotional Justice Unplugged. And um, you're joining me for a few good chat. Um, we're talking about the F word. That is the global emotional justice campaign that um, I created, inspired by a trip that I made in 1997 to South Africa. The thing that's weird, of course, is that I made the trip to South Africa. I'm Esther Armour, and I'm the creator of Emotional Justice Unplugged. And um, we're talking about the F word. That is the global emotional justice campaign Okay, so we have what we call a slight technical hitch. Oh, technology is so crazy. So um, you've been listening to me, Esther Amar, talk about the F word, uh, the 12-day global emotion justice campaign. As I explained, it was inspired by a trip in 1997 to South Africa. What is weird is that I started the campaign, I planned it right at the beginning of this year, because it was a year of global camp, it was a year of campaigns on all different issues. Technology is so crazy. One. So, um, um, I decided that I wanted to do a camp. I wanted to end the year on a campaign about reimagining black love and engaging in active forgiveness. And the question was figuring out what that campaign would be. And so. Um, I've just created these four questions around forgiveness. And I was in South Africa back in 1997 um, covering the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I had spoken to different politicians about forgiveness and amnesty and how the, the global media narrative was about how amazing this whole forgiveness thing was. And I remember meeting with Adelaide Tambo, Oliver Tambo's wife, and Adelaide Tambo said to me, go to the township and go and speak to the women of South Africa about forgiveness, and then write your story. And I went, I went to Alexandria, and I remember women telling extraordinary stories, specifically about, they were really not interested in this political idea of forgiveness, and they were not definitely not interested in forgiving or dealing with any white man, the challenges they spoke about having was forgiving the black man who lay in their bed every night because they had buried their children, or forgiving themselves what they had to go through because of the brutality of apartheid. So I remember then writing a message to myself that one day I wanted to create a campaign around black love and forgiveness. And so that was 1997, here we are, 2013, and here's the campaign. So that was the inspiration for it. Ebony.com is our partner. And um, so here we are. I'm joined this morning by Dr. Abari Cartman. Abari wrote an amazing card that was addressed to his mother, dear mama. And uh, if you're tweeting us, you can tweet hashtag the F word, or you can follow me at Esther Amar, or follow Abari uh, at ocartman1, um, and you can tweet out this conversation. So, Abari Kutman in Chicago. Yeah. Hello, everyone. 
Good morning, afternoon, wherever you at. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the campaign. It's a beautiful, powerful thing you're doing. I'm uh, proud and happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Your card really, I mean, it moved me to tears when I read it. It moved so many people to tears. That first line, dear mama, um, I seek forgiveness for wishing you would just die sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just, it's, I mean, it, you just literally stop when you read that. And um, so first of all, talk about why you even wanted to join this campaign. Um, when I first saw the idea, that was a really a brilliant idea. I, I, I think that social media and the technology can go in a bunch of different ways. And I think a lot of times that people think about it as a thing that distances people from each other and creates a lot of superficial superficiality. Um, but I have found that you can really find ways, if you're deliberate about it and meaningful about it, to use technology and social media to have really profound conversation and to build authenticity between people, even though there's a screen that, you know, distances you or, or time zones or locations that distance people. I think that we've been able to find ways through campaigns like this to, to really build meaningful interactions between human beings. And so I saw, I initially thought about this as an opportunity to do that to contribute to um, the building of authentic relationships and emotional experiences and catharsis and healing and and, um, and building for people in a very meaningful and authentic way. And so I just want to say, any time I see a chance to do that in real life or in social media life, I find, you know, I, I'm excited about that as, as an opportunity. And so, I'm in, 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 and again, in a lot of my writings, I, I try to be personal, I try to be real, I try to be honest, because I feel like there's so much fake in the world, and there's so much, you know, there's so much pretend that we need as much, you know, just just refugee, just really, like, gut, you know, authenticity as possible. So, I, t I saw this as a campaign for that, a campaign for authenticity, and I, I'm, I'm all about contributing to that every time I see the opportunity to present itself. That's really powerful because um, when we created the uh, the Tumblr, the Emotional Justice Tumblr, which is called the Swag Spot, and yeah, yeah. Um, the when we created it, it was specifically about that. It was that how do you create intimate public conversations that break down our geographical borders and boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And make still make what is considered to be technical space safe mm -hmm. enough uh -huh. to engage and to share and to be vulnerable and to talk right. about things right. that are challenging and difficult. And um, I think also what is really um, powerful is the way in which um, so we. All my campaigns are, glo are global because I'm a global chick. I was, as you can tell from my accent, I'm born in London. And um, uh, our first card from London came literally today. We've had cards from Nigeria, all across the United States. And I think that was part of what was necessary, showing that you can, you really can be in a conversation with your entire global community. It just depends on the, um, the boundaries that you set the framework that you create, the vision that you build, um, and the work that you're trying to do. So with emotional justice, it's always about, I define it as transforming the legacy of untreated trauma into triumph. Okay, and okay. the work is then, how do you make that sentence, which is a philosophy, how do you make that practical, real, mm -hmm and actually physically engage in, in a way right. that is physical. So we did it in October with 31 for Marissa, which was a campaign around Marissa Alexander and uh, right. domestic violence, specifically engaging men. And so with this one, um, like I said, I wanted to do something about reimagining black love and active forgiveness, like taking part in something specific. So we talked a bit about why. Um, 
let's talk about just the detail of your actual card. First of all, okay, let me make one more quick point about yeah, sure. the campaign in general. The um, yeah. the other thing that's occurring to me almost live as you're talking about it is is also how powerful it is for you to call a campaign Black Love, particularly one that is a global campaign, because we have a lot of Black division around the world, between nationalities or ethnicities, and, and being able to call something Black these days is almost a taboo thing. It's almost like it's almost old-fashioned to talk about Black people. And so, to do it in a way that connects black people in London and South Africa and the United States, I think is a very important thing to continue to do. Because we understand just through the history that people ended up across the diaspora, sometimes arbitrarily, um, and that we have sort of created identities around the differences between blackness, but black love is the same thing all over. And we need black love all over. And we need to be able to reaffirm our blackness and connect with other black people that are doing that and do it in a loving way. And so that, that was the, that's the other thing that's really attractive to me about this campaign is that we're not talking about black love in Chicago. We're talking about black love in the world, which is something that doesn't happen that often. Um, so I think, again, thank you for for that. It's my pleasure, and it's it's really important to me as somebody who who walks with multiple identities. I was born in London. I live yeah. here in New York City. My family is Ghanaian. I was a journalist who covered a lot of places in Africa, and I feel like I've traveled to a lot of places in Africa. I consider myself I call myself Ashanti, which is my tribe, Ghanaian, which is my nation, Africa, which is my mm -hmm. continent, um, mm -hmm. British, which is part of my environment. So I claim multiple spaces. And I think it's really important to create agendas as opposed to always be in reaction to agendas, which is not to say response doesn't matter, but I think you have to decide what you want to build. Yeah, and yeah. for me, yeah, yeah. emotional justice is about building something really and recognizing the power of emotionality to shape how we move through the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, so often... Emotionality is not a thing that we nurture, it is a space that is neglected. We nurture our intellect, we nurture our education, that's mm -hmm. where we make our living, make our money and make our way. But actually it's our emotionality that often interrupts progress or shapes our relationships, shapes our the way we move through the world. And emotional justice was about recognizing one, as a people we have a real a really deep commitment to justice, but we also have intimate relationship with both injustice and violence and how do you change that in a practical way and I don't mean it I don't mean creating ide more ideology or more philosophy or more intellectual exercise but how do you mm -hmm. emotionally engage and break those barriers down and so yeah. that is what emotional justice is about is the creative ways to do that that are very very practical. I do it with plays I do it with campaigns we do it with writing and so that's kind of the foundation of this of these campaigns. And we've had campaigns all year. This is the last one that we closed yeah. the year with. And we wanted to close the year with a campaign, having done campaigns about violence, about you know, men and masculinity and love, about girls and power. We wanted to mm -hmm. together as a community and do one about black love and forgiveness right at the end of the year. And it will be every single year. We might launch yeah. it from different parts of the world but it will always be online and it will, we'll do it every single year. That's the intention. That's the intention. I love it. I love it. So let's talk about your card. Okay. Amazing. Thank you very much. Why did you write a card to your mother? Why dear mama? Um, when I first thought about forgiveness, I thought... The, the first thing I thought about, my very first thought when uh, I was invited to write something from a friend of mine, uh, Liz, I first thought about asking her to forgive me. Um, no, 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 I'm sorry, not her to forgive me. I first thought about asking me to forgive her. Because a lot of times when I think about my relationship with her, I think about it being unfair that so soon, because she started to show signs of early dementia at 50 
And so I thought that it was not fair for her to leave me so soon. And so a lot of my experience with dealing with her dementia has been anger at her. And so there's things that I still need from my mother. There's conversations that I have not been able to have and will never now be able to have. And I'm upset about that. And so when I see her, there's a mix of sadness that I feel about what, what's happening, but also anger at her for leaving us. And, 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 and in a lot of ways, that you know, I call it leaving because, you know, there's it, a, a medical condition, there's brain stuff that's happening. Uh, I, I don't... I'm not claiming necessarily that it was a deliberate decision to to check out, but sometimes I feel like it was. Sometimes I feel like my mother was going through so much pain and 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 not having uh, outlets and support to talk emotional uh, justice in, with communities like this, and just having to deal with it on her own and just sit on it and process it, and and it became overbearing to the point that she decided, well, I could still just still exist, but not experience the pain anymore. And so I'm going to just go. And, and I'm just going to just, I'm going to just exist now and deal with whatever that is. So sometimes it feels like she really just said, I'm going a, I'm to a see y'all later. And, I'm, and, I get, and I get upset when I think about her like that. So the first thing, when I first thought about thinking about forgiveness, I thought about, about her needing to forgive. Me needing to forgive her for me being upset with her, but then just when I thought more about it, I thought, well, you know, this is this, the, the, this process, this big, authentic and emotional is really, I mean, ultimately about ourselves, and that we, as the experts of, of, of ourselves and and the persons most responsible for our own experiences, we need to really be able to own up to what we need and what we do wrong and where we make mistakes first. You know, so maybe if I had a follow-up letter, my next letter might be about me being upset with my first letter is like what I'm doing wrong and where I need to check myself as I, you know, I'm responsible for my own growth and my maturity and my progress. And so the letter started, started about outside of me, but then it went to me. And so then I started about what am I, you know, how, how how am I handling what I've been given in ways that I, I need to seek forgiveness for? And so that's where the idea came from, just, you know, just having to, to rethink how I approach this as a burden versus, in some ways, it's, it's an opportunity to to reciprocate the care that she gave, she gave me. You know, and, and a lot of children don't get that opportunity. And so, so sometimes I think about it as a burden, but now, you know, when I think, when I rethink it, I say, you know, I, I, I'm glad to be able to give back in the way that he gave to me. It's, it sort of keeps the, the, the balance between us alive. But I wouldn't have had that opportunity if I didn't, wasn't put in a position to have to care for her. Um, so I, so I, go, I go around when I think about the dynamics and the position and the place I, I'm in. And, it, and so there's just a lot to sort out logically, emotionally, and all that, and so I just wanted to write, and write about it. This is something I, I don't think a whole lot about, a lot a whole lot about, and so the opportunity came, and I thought I should just deal with my mama and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the care providing stuff, there's a lot of just day-to-day, -day, just go to the motion, you feed her, you shower her, you dress her, you give her the medicine, um, you make sure she's safe, and so there's that. A whole lot of time to just sit and like reflect on what happened. You just kind of wake up one day and you're like, oh, okay, this is my life forever. Um, the moments to, to really to really think about it, feel about it, and process it um, are are rare for me. And I, I just, when I saw this, the with the campaign, I said I need to to use this moment for that for me to take a moment for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so powerful because that's one of the things, I mean, I learned it personally, that forgiveness is always for you first. Mm -hmm. um, it's always the opportunity to stop change a past that you can't change and yeah. allow you 
you an opportunity to create a different present because that's what you can you can right. change that's what you can control and then it also it then will change how you move forward because you're not carrying the um, pain and the trauma and the burden of that on your shoulders um, yeah. and so then I wonder for you because you start off talking about like you said the anger and the just those words that, that people, people would naturally, we would instinctively judge, but they're so important to be able to say in order to mm -hmm. breathe. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In order to be able to just breathe yeah. and let go of that yeah. thing straight away and not judge yourself. So yeah. then, um, and then you go on, you talk about thanking her for the kind of mother that she was and the genius that she was for you and your, mm -hmm. your um, siblings. I wonder if you could just talk a bit about just the journey emotionally for you, mm -hmm. putting the words down and, and how that felt? Um, I did it really quick. It's kind of one of those things like, you know, eating vegetables as a kid. Like, you just, you know you have to do it. <laughs> and so you just, you just run, rush right through it. You just go. And so yeah. I didn't get it. I wrote it maybe in a half an hour. I just <laughs> sat down and I just, I just, my fingers just kept moving. And it was almost maybe two days later that I read it again and and really cried for the first time. I cried some while I was writing it, but I was too busy writing it to really experience the emotions that I was ex expressing. And so in in the moment, the, the writing of it was was much more... Just, you know, I even sent it real quick just because, like, a, you know, when, when you first had it, when we were emailing about it, I was catching at it because I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even have time to really like proofread it because it wasn't an intellectual exercise. It wasn't to make sure my 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 T's are, are, are my eyes are dotted. It was really, I just need to get it out. And then as I'm deciding about sharing it in public, um, because first it was, you know, it was on, it's on your blog, and it's still not public for me because it's people that don't know me. But then I have a decision to share it on my own Facebook page to my own friends and my siblings and my family and her brothers. I'm saying if I have to think about whether or not I'm ready to have this conversation publicly with my, my, my intimate people. And all that was a real quick decision. All within an hour, I just had to get it out. Um, because there was an awareness inside of me that it needed to happen, but I felt like if I thought about it too much, I'd think myself out of the need for the emotional processing of it. Um, so that's, that's, how the, that's how I wrote it. I wrote it really fast and, and almost like, you know, close my eyes and just pretend, you know, just hope for the best, and then and here we are. Um, but I might, I might have, you know, if I, if I went back and proofread it, I might have changed things. I might have been worried about what people might have thought about me thinking about killing my mother, you know, the, the judgment of it or, you know, just the harshness of it. So so it was something that was very was very raw in that it didn't go through a lot of intellectual processing. It was really much more emotional in its delivery and expression and even the process of deciding to share it was a very impulsive, quick, spontaneous decision. Um, which I, you know, which I think is I think we should have moments like that that are just pure, this is how I feel, this is what I think, I'm going to say it and, and deal with the consequences later. Um, there's just so much, you know, presentation and who we are and who we share that uh, sometimes we can over-rehearse a thing and, and lose the, the meat of it. Um, so for me, I, I was happy to just, to just have a moment and be honest. And, and be honest, privately and publicly, at almost at the same time, because I didn't really have time to to, to deal with the, the publicness of it. Because um, if I had, I might have, you know, talked myself out of it. So it was, it was, a, it was a simultaneous, authentic, raw, pu public, private moment of, of healing for me. That you know, and when that happens, it tends to trigger, you know. Uh, emotions and, and connections between other people because everyone has those raw, pure, authentic emotional moments and the, you know, again, the, the media piece allows us sometimes to share that um, and, and so you get to experience a moment that I had and it 
it reminds you of moments that, that you had. And it, may, it might be a completely different story, but it's still just the, the pureness of the emotion is the thing that connects human beings. You know, it's just the thing that we all share, but we don't always share. If you don't know. Um, so that's some of the things. That was a little bit about the process. That is so true. Um, your card then inspired, we had a, a card from a, a sister in Nigeria who mm -hmm. asked us not to put it on the Tumblr, but she wanted to write it after reading yeah. yours. She just yeah. wanted the process of putting it down. Yeah, um, yeah. And I thought that was really amazing. And then we got another card from a woman who talked about holding on to 20 years worth of resentment towards her mother read your card and then wrote hers and hers was put up on the Tumblr. So um, I think that's the power of, that. that's one, the power of the campaign but also the power of being able to use um, digital, te digital technology because you know you will never meet that lady who's in Nigeria but she connected on the basis of the truth of what she wrote and yeah. found the space to be able to speak for what she was walking through and um, found comfort, you know, found yeah. comfort in those words. And I think that's really powerful. I think it's comfort. I think it's also permission. I think that when you are yeah. really honest, it gives other people permission to do that in ways that like, you, 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 might, you might not be sure that it's okay. Like, is it really okay to really feel everything inside of me? Right. Sometimes, you know, you know it's, it's okay to feel that we learn over time as adults what are the appropriate things to not even share, but to feel. And so we can catch feelings and thoughts inside of our head. We can, you know, we, we learn to just take it out. Just, no, I'm not supposed to feel that way about my father. I'm not supposed to have, uh, I'm not supposed to, to not like my kids sometimes. I'm not, you know, I'm not supposed to judge people, but you know, we have these things, and instead of really being able to address them, we kind of just ignore them, but you know, that it, it doesn't make them go away. And so sometimes, so the thing I appreciate about people that are just really, really honest is that it allows me to be really honest with myself. You know, it's just like, okay, you don't die if you're really honest. Move on, people don't hate you. It really is just, it is okay. It be completely authentic. Um, and that's what I think I, I appreciate about sharing in public, because it, it gives people permission to do that. And I feel like, um, you know, we're people who become, how can you not be distorted when so much of our relationship is with injustice and, and violence? And then oh, yeah. on, a, on a kind of a global, external level, and then you're navigating whatever's happening in your own um, personal life. And so I feel like, you know, I go back to when I, when I, um, thought about the campaign back in 1997, it was, I did three different trips, and one of them was to Ghana um, for the 40th anniversary, and that was the first time I found out from my mother about the coup, the military coup in 1966, and the soldiers that broke into um, our house and put a gun to my mother's head, and she literally was in a space where she just thought, I have four girls in front of me, I, I have to figure out who I'm, who, who do I save? Who will get left? Mm -hmm. Who might get yeah, killed yeah, yeah. in this? You know, it was yeah, just yeah. one of those crazy environments. And she'd held on to that and never talked about it with her, with us for, uh, it was over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I heard a story. And although I had no memory of that actual night, the legacy of that night of trauma, I had lived out, my sisters had lived out in all these different ways. So right, it's one right. of the reasons why I say emotional justice is not just about being present for the acts that are traumatic, but the legacy of that untreated trauma carries generation to generation to generation. And when it's not treated, when it's not dealt with, when it's not challenged um, compassionately, when it's not confronted, it can be the thing that continues to shape your experiences, the way you walk, the way you love, the way you engage, the way you work, the way you build. And we see it... Um, institutionally and individually. Um, yeah, and so yeah. I feel like it's really important to find ways to be able to give ourselves and each other permission just mm -hmm. to just feel in yeah. a space 
that is um, that is safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder for you now, some days after the fact, mm -hmm. having seen the response. Yes, yeah, there was a really powerful response to your card. There's been a powerful response to all the cards, mm -hmm. but I think it was definitely. Um, how does it sit with you now, after the fact? Um. I'm glad I did it. No regrets yet. <laughs> I um. I think that again, the the permission idea didn't for for my my immediate circles allow for just feeling, but it also allowed for permission to have conversations that a lot of us have been avoiding around my mother. And since the card, uh, people kind of like people have come up to me. And like almost, and still, still in almost a hush. Like, I don't want to say, I don't want you to know that I read it, because if, 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 if I think if people felt like they were reading my journal and they felt like guilty for being exposed to my innermost difficult thoughts, but you know, I, I know, I know it was public. You know, it wasn't like an accident. It, so, so I was okay that people were reading it, and 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 it was, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing because I didn't necessarily want it to be an invitation to talk about it so much. Um, I kind of just, I just wanted, to, like I said all I had to say about it. It wasn't, it wasn't like a cry for for support. I didn't want people to call and say, oh, you know, we can talk about it, let's process it. I didn't, I don't even, I didn't need that or want that. Um, so I had to sort of deal with, with that as a response from people. Um, but amongst themselves, it, it allowed people a chance to, to, to talk about my mother. Because she had, she, she was very impactful in the community. We have a, a, a big family. And... It's, it's been the kind of thing that people don't really know how to respond to or what to do about. So sometimes, I mean, people used to come by and visit earlier more often, but the, the more they saw her sort of deteriorate, they were like, I just don't even know what to do with her no more. I don't, you know, I don't know how to respond to a person with dementia or with mental illness because, you know, these are sort of taboo kind of things. We just, um, we are in a society where we can, we're used to just drugging people away, and then stick them in institutions, and they become out of sight, out of mind. But when when we have to deal with it every day, there, there becomes a process of having to learn how to to navigate mental illness. And and I think a lot of people have been, and, our, and my personal family have been avoiding dealing with that process because mm -hmm. it, it's hard and it hurts. And if you can get away with it, then you can just pretend like it's not happening. Um, so the letter for me personally in my in my communities forced people to not pretend like it wasn't happening anymore. And so I've just, just been hearing of conversations that are happening around her and around my family that would not have happened otherwise. Uh, so a couple of days later, one of that's, that's one of the things I appreciate the most about it is that not that people sort of feel sorry for me now, but that people have to address it. Um, they have to think about whether or not they have felt like they've been supportive of us or not supportive of us, whether or not they've been avoiding thinking about it or not, and just just their own personal responses to their cousin or their sister or whoever you know she is to them. Because to, to me, she's my mother, so we have a, our individual relationship. And she has she has relationships with lots of other people that don't ever see her. Um, and so me writing something publicly and people sharing it and, and you know emailing it to other family members has made us talk about it in a way that would not have happened uh, otherwise. So I, I, I think that's the thing that I appreciate about the after effect of it, after my own personal you know experience of it, the, the community and the family experience of it was initiating a conversation that desperately needs to be had and continue. You know, these are conversations that. Um, black communities don't like to have, you know, because because of the institutional stuff and the injustice stuff. There's so much just built-in infrastructure pain that if we can choose to not deal with extra pain, if we can volunteer ourselves out of having to deal with the emotional stuff and mental health and physical health and kind of and the kind of stuff that happens to just regular humans everywhere. And on top of having to deal with this regular life human stuff. We always have to, have to deal with institutional pain and oppression, and so I think that makes black communities much more hesitant to deal with the mental health kind of stuff that we deal with. Um, so having public conversations makes us talk about it.
it makes us, you know, think about it, and it makes people, instead of just saying, hey, how's your mom, um, say, is there anything that I can do to help, mm-hmm. which is, you know, already a very different conversation. Um, because, you know, and people have seen her, I still I would take her out to events sometimes, and people would just pretend like she's still normal, and just say, you know, hey, Carla, you know, what, what you been up to, and, and then she would respond how she responds, and then they would just keep moving about their day. And, and not think about it, or maybe not share their thoughts about it with me, um, but this has made us talk about it. This, this was something that was so bold that you couldn't ignore it anymore. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's the, one of the things that's happened in the days since in response to it. Wow, wow, that's powerful, it's beautiful. Um, so we, we just wanted to spend some time and um, talk to you about your card and your experience and why you chose to um, um, take part. We're going to do this with other folks who wrote cards, some of whom did sign, some of whom didn't sign. And then when I put the word out that I was going to do a moderated Google chat, folks yeah. said, well, I would like to engage in that. So this is the first, and we're going to do several over the, um, the coming weeks. The campaign is called The F Word. An mm-hmm. intimate revolution, because that's what I believe forgiveness is. It's an intimate revolution. And um, if you want to take part, we do it for 12 days. So today is day 12. And then the actual formal kind of 12 days of Christmas, so called, start from January the 20th, start from December the 25th through to January the 2nd. So we're going to retweet all the cards that came through and then do some more chats with um, folks who sent cards, because we had sisters sending cards to the old wounds they sustained through past loves. We had a, a young, young sister talking about being the child of parents who had substance abuse issues and the challenges she felt around that. Um, mm-hmm. We had so many different types of cards talking about different types of issues. We had a father asking his children for forgiveness because of his own closeted sexuality. There have been That's so many different we cards. Were, uh, together. Oh, you did? Yep, me and Sadler. We, yep, known him. Wow, wow, that is amazing. That is amazing. And so we're going to bring this conversation to an end. Uh, Abari Cartman, thank you so much for taking part. No problem. Thank you again for the, uh, initiating and launching the campaign and being so committed to not our just intellectual growth, but our emotional growth, our comprehensive human holistic growth, and sharing it and being public about it and. And and, and, and and again, and initiating the, because I'm a psychologist, and I'm used to forms where we're doing intimate stuff in person, but there's something really powerful about it. Like, I'm just now, first, for the first time, doing a Google chat. You, you taught me that, that my phone has the capability of doing a video conversation. I didn't even know that happened. So, so, I, so I really appreciate you taking this to the next level, to, like modernizing temporizing old stuff in a way that can be palatable, particularly for young people, because young people are on the stuff. They're doing yeah. the technology. And so the old people are thinking that young people are just on the phones and they're zombies and they're not really connecting no more. But, but you know, we know that they're still, even through text messages, even through Facebook, are really having intimate, revolutionary, justice-oriented conversations that sometimes need to be moderated still by the experience of, of elders and old people that have more experience. So I really appreciate, you know, uh, your approach to, to this. Um, I think it's, it's very powerful what you're doing. And so thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really appreciate those kinds of words. And so folks who are listening and watching, you can take part two. You can write a card. It's really simple. The entire process is on our Tumblr, which is called The Swag Spot. If you just Google The Swag Spot Tumblr, it will come up straight away. And literally on the first, as you scroll through, it will take you through exactly what you have to do. You address your card to anybody you want. You don't have to use your real name. You can if you choose. It can be to somebody else. It can be to yourself. And then we ask you four questions um, about forgiveness. And the way that you create your card is by answering those questions. And then you email it completed to us at the swagspot7 at gmail.com, 
and um, I'll correspond with you back and forth, and then it will go up on the Tumblr, and then it gets tweeted out. And the point of it is, it's not snail mail, all the cards of our digital exchange. And the idea is that your words will help who knows who with their words, with their transformation, with their emotionality, uh, in ways that we can't imagine. And it's designed this way because we used to do live events, we still do live events, right here in New York City, and we used to get so many emails from all over the place. So I wanted to create a space where if you were a 16-year-old kid out in Mississippi and you're not going to be able to come to the event in New York, you can still connect via technology. And so that is what the Tumblr is for. We call it the Digital Village, uh, the place for intimate public conversation. That is what emotional justice is about. We do it through art, through conversation, and through creative campaign. And the F word is the last creative campaign of 2013. So, um, Abari, thank you so much. We're going to sign off. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. You too. Take care.